before we get into this episode, I want to put a little disclaimer out there. I want to discuss with you why I'm recording this podcast episode, and this revolves around a a very traumatic experience I had growing up, and I want to say that before getting into the story, uh, everybody's journey to healing is uniquely their own, and I am not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I am just sharing one deeply personal story, so I ask for grace and understanding with that. Um, when I ask myself the question, if you were to die tomorrow, what would you regret not saying or doing in your life? My why for sharing this story about these traumatic events, uh, my intention is to encourage or provide hope for someone who may be listening to this who also grapples with coming to terms of having domestic violence um, or yeah, household trauma. So in the words of Tim Ferriss, I am a big believer in making your trauma part of your medicine and your strength that ultimately you use in how you move about the world. And a final note, um, I reserve the right to completely change my opinions and story at any moment in time. Thank you. 2003, sixth grade. I was in my gifted and talented program at my Austin, Texas school, and I coveted my thigh-high socks paired perfectly with my skater shoes and completing the look with a mini skirt from Hot Topic. I was deep into my a band shirt a day will keep the doctor away philosophy. My all time favorite shirt being a mockery of the pop culture shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. Only my shirt said, Bert is my homeboy and it was adorned with safety pins and featured the luscious Burt McCracken, lead singer of The Used, my favorite screamo post-hardcore band whose lyrics were my lifeline at the time. Welcome to season two of the Ruby Hour. I am your host, Shelby Ring, and today is one of our narrative story pieces where I will be sharing moments in my life involving identity, sexuality, and relationships. A word of caution about today's episode. This is quite an explicit episode. It involves some sensitive topics involving alcoholism, domestic abuse, and self-mutilation, and I thought it only appropriate to pair that with some rather hardcore music and sound scoring. So if any of those topics or the music selection are triggering to you, I invite you to check out one of our other episodes in the feed. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of The Ruby Hour. I proudly wore my Bert is my homeboy shirt as a statement piece, a conversation without having to have a conversation and a deterrent to any peer or adult who might accidentally think I'm interested in conforming to a set of rules dictated by a bunch of boring jerks who make their daughters wear oversized t-shirts at pool parties. No, thank you. Bert McCracken filled my 14-year-old fantasies. An older punk friend of mine told me about how she'd seen them at the Warp Tour. I remember watching a music video of their song, A Box of Sharp Objects, and instantly falling in love with Burt McCracken. The music
music video shows highlights of the members of the group, a motley crew of tattooed and pierced early 20-something-year-old skater boys hanging out in a dilapidated barn or basement. Cool. I can do that. Them walking to a convenience store. I can do that too. And performing their shows. Bert, the lead singer, had this goofy, playful side of him in the videos. He would make these crazy faces while he would sing. Oh my gosh, he is so sexy. Jutting, strong jawline with a scruffy five o'clock shadow. Sexy, greasy hair. But when he would scream, those rough micro tears of his vocal cords, it was like he would rip the words from some dark, feral part of his soul. And something clicked a vicious, unsettling rage in my own soul that wanted out too. My brother was the coolest, funniest person I knew growing up. Three years older than me, he was my idol. An awesome soccer player. We spent our weekends as a family traveling to his tournaments that took us all across Texas. I would run up and down the chalk sidelines at his soccer games. In my mind, I was forever on his team. I would follow him and his friends around the house and through the woods, doing anything I could to be allowed to stay in their midst. When he'd had enough of me sucking the coolness out of the room with his buddies, I'd face rejection and walk away, only to quickly, sneakily return and linger around a corner, still vicariously getting to be a part of the pack. I would do anything to be accepted by my brother playing video games, making funny voices. One time I ate dry dog food covered in ketchup and mustard on my hands and knees just to get my brother and his friends to laugh and let me hang around with them for a few more minutes. My brother and dad weren't transitioning into the space of man and teenage son coming into his manhood well. From 12 to 14, our home life became a war zone. Tense, on edge, my parents attempting to hold their ground of control, doing what they knew to keep their house in order, trying to relate to my brother and myself, becoming teenage, angst-fueled, hormone-surging humans, and my brother and I reaching for our own forms of self-expression. My brother started stepping into his first stepping away from a successful soccer player trajectory. He traded in a soccer ball for a half stack amp and guitar. And the sorrowful chords of Nothing Else Matters by Metallica began reverberating off the walls of my brother's bedroom. He grew out his hair, formed Schwakene, a band with his former select soccer team friends, and they would practice out in my dad's shop. I had never been so proud of my brother. I don't know the details of the whys. Going down a bad path is what I was told. But my dad knew what he learned from his dad and his broken home life. That when your son presents characteristics you don't understand, beat it out of them. arguments, my dad and brother's anger matching and escalating, and hearing smacks, claps, and sharp inhales from my brother's bedroom, all before putting my backpack on to go stand with Ryan and Amelia at my bus stop on the way to go to middle school. The Ruby Hour will return after this brief musical break.
didn't know what to do with the pain that I felt, with the fear that I felt, and not knowing how to help, comfort, or protect my brother. I didn't know what to do with this gnawing, hollow, disgust, and anger I felt at my dad laying a hand and raising a voice to this newfound, beautiful sense of self-expression flowing out of my 15-year-old brother. This boy, attempting to step into his manhood and having this aggressive, alcoholic, the protector in his life becoming his number one oppressor, beating the manhood right out of him. I needed to feel pain too. My brother was hurting physically, emotionally, the core of his being. Maybe if I felt pain in my body, it would be my own silent revolt and rebellion against the violence against my beloved brother. And in some strange way, I could help him carry his pain. It started with salt and ice. All my friends thought it was this cool and entertaining challenge. Sprinkle a little salt on your hand, get an ice cube, and see how long you could handle the pain as the result of the salt, ice, and your body heat, creating a unique chemical burn that would damage your skin and nerve endings. My friends did it for fun at lunch, but I took the craft home and started practicing solo. After every violent, tension-filled argument turned physical, I would escape into my room and find my stash. Through my rage-filled, heartbroken tears, I took to starting with a base layer of salt and ice, getting a nice chemical burn, and that would be my first round of pain. Then I'd take one of my dad's favorite ballpoint ink pens and begin stabbing into the icy numbness stabbing sometimes accidentally into my tendons and ligaments. I still have tracings of some of these sessions today. Then I found one of my dad's razor blades from one of his tools. When an argument would break out, when doors would slam, I would retreat into the corner of my bedroom, dedicated to the transmutation of pain. Reveling and being terrified in the pain I'd need to inflict on my skin. This time needing to match the pain in my heart and mind from the latest incident. Slicing lines across my knuckles, ankles, feet, legs, hip bones. It was like valves. As the blood would surface, I would imagine reprieve. Brother, I am so sorry. I'd hide these atonements in places that could easily be written off as collateral damage from a romp in the woods or by a slice of the sharp edge of the fish tank while feeding them. Candy bracelets and rave bracelets were popular in my friend group, so I began hiding the cuts on my wrist through my Rasta Marley sweatbands and layered fluorescent gummy bracelets. The self-titled album, The Used, became my sanctuary. I would put on blue and yellow and wail into my pillow. I would lose myself screaming along with the vocal cord shredding chorus of a box of sharp objects. I've often wondered if this was a nature or nurture situation. Did I model my rage and self-mutilation because of these lyrics that I listened to on repeat? Or did I already have that rage and heartache instinctively leading me to self-harm? And those lyrics soothed me in knowing that I wasn't the only one who knows despair. I think of my friend group then, 
my mix of hyper creative, hyper intelligent friends, many of whom were a year or two older than me, many also students in the gifted and talented program, adorning themselves with top hats, Marilyn Manson swag, skate shoes, and safety pins. Were they also experiencing hell on earth in their homes? Unspoken wounds from silent oppressors sitting across from them at the dinner table, being expected to smile and act like everything's normal when heartbreak, denial, rage, and fear are bellied up to the same table. Maybe most of my punk friends were just into the creative self-expression and counterculture. The kind of thing that's now celebrated amidst these Gen Z and Gen Alpha eight-year-olds walking around with washable streaks of blue and purple in their hair. I think it was a mixed bag. Some of my friends' parents were emotionally absent, struggling with substance abuse. I knew some of my friends who had a parent in prison. And I also had friends who had parents that were the, our coolest substitute teachers and staff at our school. And from what I saw, they completely supported their children and their fellow raccoon-eyed friends on their pursuit of their counterculture identity. My world became dedicated to rising against any form of oppression that came my way, which, as you can imagine, as a teenage girl, you can only think of all the things I could put in that category. I don't give a crap, I'm taking a dick now. Don't need no earn, I'm feeding the world. Anything that got in the way of me expressing myself the way that I wanted, I was dedicated to finding a way around it. My parents found out I met up with a 15-year-old boy I met on AIM and sat on his lap at a youth group outing at a water park at 12 years old. They decided to take away all forms of self-expression. I think that was the only trick they had up their sleeve and threw away all of my black clothing, black eyeliner, ripped down my mural of rock band boy crushes, and they told me that life would be nothing but church, God, and school, and I can't be around any boys. Fine. My best friend will give me her old eyeliner. I'll change into my punk rock ensemble of mini skirts and makeup on the bus. I'll bring my sexually inquisitive female friends home and make out with them for the entire duration of your Wednesday night Bible study that's happening six feet away in the other room. Sneak my boyfriend over when you're at work. That works for me. Still got all A's in school, still at the top of my class. I would just walk this debatable line between being a troubled or curious, open-minded teenager. The used sang my counterculture anthem, and Burt McCracken was my 12, 13, 14-year-old guide for what I was looking for in a man, a man who could feel his feelings, shred his vocal cords, and projectile vomit over 10 rows of people at a show. Oh, he's so dreamy. Maybe the song, A Box of Sharp Objects, encouraged me to cope through self-mutilation. Or maybe I found that path myself. It was the only way I found to express my abhorrence and disgust for the sins of my father's forefathers, who taught that violence and mutilation of a home life was okay. And so I found inflicting violence and mutilation on my own body was my way. 
The words raging through Burt McCracken's shredded vocal cords offered me refuge in a time when I didn't know how to speak up and voice my own rage or voice the grief that I carried in my heart for the two men that I loved the most in my life. This story isn't an easy story to tell, partially because it's a very personal one, partially because there were a number of repercussions from those times that are not my story to tell, and partially because it sheds light on a dark part of my family's history. Can you relate to this? I mean, scrolling through Instagram or Facebook all you see are these perfectly iconic family portraits, these snapshots from present-day families. And I guess I share this story to show a not-so-Instagrammable snapshot of what made me who I am. I saw this thing Tony Robbins said on the I Am Not Your Guru documentary on Netflix a couple of years ago. I'm gonna butcher it, but it went something like this. A woman stands up in the crowd who starts off by saying how her love life sucks. She's taken all of her energy and put it into building this massively successful career, but meanwhile, she can't seem to find a stable partner in her life and she thinks that somehow she's repelling all of the good ones because she didn't have a good role model from her dad. What Tony Robbins said next changed my life. If you're going to blame, blame eloquently. If you're gonna blame your dad for your shitty love life, blame him also for the drive that you learned how to channel for success because your dad was forever telling you that you weren't good enough. Blame your dad for how badass you are in your career. Blame your dad for that nice car and that nice house you have because you figured out how to succeed anyways. And if you're gonna blame, blame eloquently. Get a full, accurate accounting of the effect your dad had on your life. Your love life? That's one segment, that's one fragment of who you are and how you relate in the world. If you're gonna blame, gonna blame, 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 blame eloquently. eloquently. Now, I'm not perfectly documenting Mr. Robbins verbatim, and I highly recommend if you haven't seen that documentary, I Am Not Your Guru, go check it out. It's, it made a big impact on me. To this day, I love my dad and all that he is stubborn, strong-willed, opinionated, hothead, forever oscillating between cutting alcohol out of his life cold turkey for months and then rolling right back into his pounding beers way of life. He's had his own journey and work around our family's path and with what he's been conditioned to do and know. I know that he shared with me a story of he was living out of a car by the age of 14 years old. He's come leaps and bounds and light years away from the type of home life that he knew. Maybe you grew up in a not so perfect household or in a house with violence. Maybe you've had your share of self-inflicted mutilation to cope with pain. Once I became a Christian, by the way, and cutting yourself was labeled demonic, I traded my razor blade for binging and purging and over-exercising. It's a sneakier way to hide dysfunction. Through all of that, I firmly believe that we are all doing the best we know how to do with the tools that we are given. My parents were doing the best that they knew with the tools they had from their range of upbringing and experience. So if I want to blame my parents for ruining my sense of safety and shelter in the world, then I also need to blame them for my untouchable drive that I've always had to find my truth no matter what's thrown at me, said over me, 
physically attempted to resist me, I will always find a way around it. I blame them for the way that I have fiercely fought for offering kindness and compassion to people that I don't know, especially preteens and teenagers, because you never know what they may have gone through before standing at that bus stop on their way to sixth grade. I blame my parents for instilling my unrelenting drive for offering grace to people whom I don't understand or identify with how they choose to present themselves to the world. My biggest work has been towards people who like to size up and label others' ways of life as either right or wrong, all in the name of love because I used to be the queen of that kind of judgmental, close-minded love. I love my mom and I love my dad very much and I still am forever my big brother's biggest fan. Maybe a box full of sharp objects helped me slice open this truth in this lifetime. A lesson of who I am in all of my scars. I finally found some eyes that see me from the inside. Nothing left to hide, not even from myself. Phew, that one was a doozy, right? Oh, let's just take a few breaths after that one. The Ruby Hour is created, sound scored, and produced by my company, Ruby Riot Creatives, a video production company based out of Charleston, South Carolina. To see pictures of my 13-year-old self rocking my coveted Bert is my homeboy shirt and punk rock miniskirt, visit rubyriotcreatives.com forward slash podcast to see show extras from today's episode, as well as seeing the visual episode of me sharing the story if you like a visual format like I do. The music featured in this episode is licensed for use under commercial licensing. This includes the amazing songs by Django, Spearfisher, OK Otter, Sivan Talmor, Yehixel Raz, oh, I'm going to totally butcher that, altered samples from The Used, Alex Karen, Dan Ayalon, and Jay Ray, as well as Binge Heard for our theme song this season. If you or someone you love could benefit from some emotional support or are struggling during this time, check out To Write Love on Her Arms, a nonprofit movement we support as a company dedicated to presenting hope and finding help for people struggling with depression, addiction, self-injury, and suicide. To Write Love on Her Arms exists to encourage, inform, inspire, and invest directly into treatment and recovery. Go to their website, twloha.com forward slash self dash care, or check out their podcast where they are discussing many of the challenges each of us face through this pandemic and times of social isolation. I hope that you have a beautiful week filled with stories worth telling. Walking on the bright side Never have to hide again Together never has to end And we'll